Also, herzlich willkommen hier am Tag 3 der 21. Äh, 21. Gulaschko-Programmiernacht äh, ähm, hier im Medientheater. Wir haben heute wieder einen sehr interessanten Vortrag, bei dem es um Observability geht und zwar mit dem LG TM-Stack. Ich möchte immer sagen LGBT-Stack und das wäre dann wahrscheinlich wieder was mit Rust und Blorhain oder so. Aber wir werden heute über den LG TM-Stacks äh, sprechen und zwar haben wir dafür heute für euch Cedi. Einen großen Applaus bitte. Hi again. Uh, it's my first talk, so uh, I'm sorry for the guys and girls that uh, watched all three of them. I hope the third one is as entertaining as the first two. Um, this slide, everyone's seen them probably once or twice already this weekend. Uh, I'm Sidi, I'm uh, an SRE. I work with uh, big and large systems, I do resiliency engineering, but I got life outside of just my computer. Uh, so I enjoy some spare time doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and yeah. So I prepared this entire talk, and then afterwards I noticed, well, I'm talking about a lot of products from Grafana Labs, which is like a for-profit company, and I realized maybe people interpret this as a sales talk. It's not. I don't work for them. This talk is not sponsored by them. But if someone from Grafana is watching, I send some swag. <laughs> so um, before we get started on observability itself, I want to clarify some things because we're going to talk about them in this talk a lot. So there is a differentiation between observability, monitoring, and telemetry. Telemetry means the way how we get our monitoring data from the server to our monitoring system. The monitoring system is Monitoring is the continuous observation of our health signals. This can be anything from metrics to logs to events to traces, literally everything. And observability is what we make out of metrics and monitoring. It's the looking into the data, understanding what the system is doing, understanding system behavior by looking at monitoring. When we talk about observability, you often hear the three pillars of observability. It's logs, metrics, and traces, and we're gonna talk through every single one of them. And neatly enough, Grafana Labs has a product placed in every category of this. For the observability front end, probably everyone already uses Grafana dashboards, right? Uh, you probably have heard of them. They're pretty nice. Oh, uh, sorry. For logs, we're going to look into Grafana Loki. For metrics and long-term metric storage, we're going to look into Mimir. And for traces, we're going to look into Tempo, and that's why it's called the LGTM stack for Loki, Grafana, Mimir, and Tempo. We do need all three of those pillars, because every single pillar answers a slightly different question that we might have. When we look at our observability platform, we want to get some answers. And metrics are really, really good for answering the question, do we have a problem? Is there something that's uh, going on in our system? Locks, on the other hand, are really good at telling us what is the actual problem. And Connecting the two sometimes is really, really hard. So we need traces to bridge the two of them, because traces tell us where is the problem, or where might the pro problem be. Before we go through the more interesting stuff like uh, Mimir and t uh, traces, we're going to start at locks, because they're pretty easy to explain. I think everyone's seen locks. They look something like this. They're usually large text files. Sometimes they're easier to read, sometimes they're harder to read. But there are some very bad examples, like multi-line logs. Great for looking at, great for humans to understand, but we usually don't want to look at them ourselves. We want to, look, we want to have log aggregation systems looking at our logs. We want to have automatic analysis of our logs. And if your log is multi-line, you can't really do that, because it's really hard to pass. So we don't do that. We, we try to have locks in a single line. Every line represents one entry. Much easier to pass by a machine. Another dark pattern is not using context. Just put something out like error. 
Yeah, nice. I, I know it's an error, otherwise it wouldn't have locked anything, right? So what we should do, and what probably everyone already knows, is structured logging. Here's an example of a structured logging log message. And it's structured because we have individual fields in our log line, and every field annotates some context. It's still easy to read by humans because you, you see the, the log format, it's just a single line. You can jump over the uninteresting labels and just read the last part, the error open some file. Still easy to read, but now you can parse it automatically by your log aggregation system. And if you use structured logging, you should stick to one of those log formats. I know it's easy, you can invent them yourself. It's, you can just print key value pairs in your printf statements. Don't, just use some standard. But what is log aggregation and why do we need it? Um, you can log into your server and just grab or tail or tail and grab something. That works great. It doesn't work so great if you have half a million servers. <laughs> you can't log into every single server and try to figure out what's going on. You need like one central place where you can go and tail your logs from there. Also, in the type of work environment that I'm in, I can't log into every server. I, I f don't have permissions to go to the, those servers. So I have to get permissions to go to the log aggregation system, and now I'm able to view the logs, because now my access is very granular just for reading the logs. Also, <clears throat> if you have log files that are like tens or hundreds of gigabytes long, good luck with grep. <laughs> it's not the slowest tool in the world, but it takes some time, and you probably don't want to do it. So Grafana came up with this amazing tool called Loki, and it had some minor hiccups in Loki v1, but now that we have Loki v2, it's actually really, really good. And if you are somewhat familiar with metrics and Prometheus, it kind of sounds similar. Instead of having an exporter that exports your metrics to Prometheus, you have Promtail. And Promtail collects all, all your log files it automatically detects all your log files on the system. It monitors syslog D and everything. Promtail takes those logs and sends them to Loki. So Promtail acts as the sender. Promtail is going to be installed on every server that we run. And Loki is the central place where we, where we go to. And of course, we access Loki through Grafana. And this is roughly how it looks. I prepared a small screenshot here. Uh, you can see here on the top we have our uh, logql query. That's the query language used by Loki. It is very similar to what we are already used to with PromQL for metric querying. And it's really powerful too. You can run log queries that return you log entries, like just as we've seen here. We, we have some log message messages below. But you can also do metric queries. You can use PromQL, uh, sorry, LogQL to create a query that queries your log files but returns metrics. So that's also super useful. For example, if you want to do graphs like the one that I show here, uh, because now you see the log volume and you can f cr create dashboards that show you the log volume for error logs in your microservice. So that's really good. I already spoke about it a little bit, why we need Grafana or why we need log aggregation, so I don't talk about this for a second time. But there are other tools out there like Elasticsearch with the Kibana front end. But Loki is amazingly easy to use. I've tried Elasticsearch clusters in the past. Um, but nothing was as easy as Loki, to be honest. I know Heiko uses uh, Splunk for it. it Kind of enterprisey, kind of expensive if you want to do it in your company, but Loki is open source, it's free. It's, uh, there is enterprise support that you can buy, but it's free, it's open source. And it scales very well. And that's going to be a major theme across all tools, they sca scale very, very well. To the other pillar of, um, of our observability stack, 
the metrics. Do we have a problem? And I think everyone should already know this. Metrics are really good uh, to identify if we have a problem. Metrics are usually emitted as time series or you have like some sort of a time series name and a value and you record it in a time series database so you can plot them just like on the screenshot here. And probably the most commonly known tool for doing this is something like Prometheus. <coughs> Prometheus came as one of the earliest Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, members. It was uh, initially developed as sort of an uh, outside of Google development of something that Google had internally. Uh, it's, it, it became the de facto standard for all metrics or time series data. It, when we talk about metrics, there are like usually two different approaches to it, like the push and the pull approach. The other big contender for first place in uh, who's the greatest metric tool is something like InfluxDB, and I, I actually know a lot of people using Influx instead of Prometheus, but it comes down to how your system behaves. Influx itself is passive, it's just there, it's a service that's there, and you need an, an active component, just like Loki for logs, you need an active component for the metrics, most of the time Telegraph, that runs on your server and then sends the data back to Telegraph, uh, to, to Influx. That's why we call uh, Influx a passive system. And Prometheus is on the other side more active. It, it, Prometheus is pulling the data from our targets. And I think I visualize this quite nicely here. And Pull is most of the time a little bit more, a little bit better than, than pull, uh, push. I personally prefer it. Um, it's, it's way less uh, overhead in your application. I don't have to worry about sending my telemetry data from my application. All I have to do is expose a metrics endpoint and I'm done. Prometheus also gives us the central, central config location. While in Telegraph, we have Telegraph configured on every server, and when we want to make a change there, we have to change a bunch of servers at the same time, which is sometimes hard to facilitate. Also in Prometheus metrics, same as in logs, we tend to add labels to it so we can carry context, like from which server does this metric originate, like the host name in this example. Or also, we, for, for, for a hypothetical example of a DNS server, we can just have one time series, that's uh, the DNS query type, and then have both the host name and the type of query as labels. Saves us some active time series, because the more active time series, the more cardinality, the harder it gets. I can't do Prometheus justice here. I only have an hour, and I could probably talk an hour just about Prometheus. So go and watch those other amazing talks. Prometheus itself is great. I love it. I, I use it on a daily basis, but it also got some problems. Prometheus does, isn't really a long-term solution. The default retention time that is configured in Prometheus is uh, 15 days. and Maybe it's just me, but I think a lot of people are like me in this regards. I want to know how did my system behave last year? How did it behave last year at the same time? So I can make accurate predictions about how it might look next year. So I can do capacity planning and uh, network traffic forecasting and those things. And Prometheus isn't really good for that, to be honest. There is the option of federating your Prometheus clusters and only federate like uh, aggregated data, but it's really, really hard and I wouldn't recommend it. So the solution is uh, Mimir. Mimir kind of adds to Prometheus. It's not a one-to-one -one replacement for Prometheus. It is a long-term storage solution and a multi-tenant solution for Prometheus as an extension. So Mimir in itself is 100% uh, compatible to Prometheus. All your Prometheus queries are still working. You don't have to worry about that. The architecture behind Mimir is slightly different, and we will go into that in a little while. 
But for now, I just want to mention it's insanely scalable. So let's say we do have a bunch of Prometheus servers and we want to add Mimir to it. So Mimir is just this big box, I know, but I want to show you why it is so scalable. Because from Prometheus, we send all of our metrics to the distributor of our Mimir cluster. And we do this using the Prometheus remote write function, which is completely built in in Prometheus. The distributor then sends the data to the ingester, and the ingester stores the data in an S3 bucket. So it's good to have like S3 storage, like in most cases nowadays. The nice part is both the distributor and the ingester can be horizontally scaled. You can have as many of those components as you want. If your workload increases, just deploy 10 million distributors, whatever. If you want to query the data, it's a little bit more complex. You're going to write your query in Grafana. Query is sent to the query front end. From the query front end, it's uh, assigned to like a uh, worker queue which is called a query scheduler and a querier, while the querier being the, uh, the active worker. And from there, it both queries the ingester, if there are any time series that haven't been written to the S3 storage yet, and it also queries the S3 buckets directly. And in each step there, we have a cache. So this improves scalability a lot. And if you run the same query twice, three times, ten times, and you have a whole engineering team working an incident and everyone hitting refresh with the same query, the query result will be in the cache, so it's blazing fast. And last but not least, we have a compactor, which is a separate microservice that you can enable, so you're not piling up hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of metrics, but it occasionally compacts the data and removes unnecessary uh, labels. And as you can tell, this slide took a very long time to build. <laughs> so advantages of Mimir, it's massively scalable. It is very cheap in terms of storage if you compare it to Prometheus. Prometheus storage usually depends on how big of a disk you can put in your server. And if you have your Prometheus on a Hetzner Cloud VM, you have to provision an even bigger server or attach uh, additional drives to it, and that gets expensive quite fast. So using S3 buckets is pretty cheap. Another advantage is you can have a single alert manager monitor, uh, sending alerts for all of your tenants. And the last part, the last pillar that I want to talk about is traces. And a trace, by definition, is the recording of all paths taken from the beginning to the end of the microservice architecture. So if we look at this example here on the left, we see that our request hits on the edge service A, and then we branch into four different microservices to fulfill this request. Um, when doing tracing, we pass all along a context between every microservice. So we have this context object passed along every time. And we can nicely visualize this in the waterfall diagram on the left. You see the time, how the time goes, and then each block is called a span. And the span is the representation of a work unit. So using this diagram, we can see that uh, probably sub-process E or microservice E takes the longest, or is the, is the part that takes the longest in our request. The nice thing about spans is that, as I said, they represent an entire unit of work. And we can attach attributes, just like in metrics and logs, to those spans. And also, we can attach events to them. And you will see this later in my uh, short demo. Um, and this really helps us figuring out where the problem is, because if there is an error somewhere along the request flow, we would see it annotated in our span that this span is the one that actually failed. But when we talk about tracing, 
it's hard to talk about it without talking about open telemetry and Jaeger. I don't want to go into the details of Jaeger because it's like its entire ecosystem with its entire observability backend. So what I want to focus on is open telemetry, which has been born as the child of open tracing and open sen sensors and is maintained by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation like a lot of projects nowadays. And one of the key things that I really like about the Open Telemetry framework is the uh, collector binary. Um, it kind of works like a gateway. You can push some data and you can push like Jaeger traces into it. You can push Open Telemetry traces. You can also push Prometheus metrics. And then you can use the collector as sort of a gateway or a transformer and uh, send them to somewhere else. For example, you could send Jaeger into the collector and export it as open telemetry, which is kind of nice. And this works seamlessly with Grafana Tempo. And the most common use case, or the way I use it in my scenarios, is I take my Prometheus metrics and my open telemetry data, pipe them into the collector, and from there I split. Um, split the requests so the logs go to Loki, the traces go to Tempo, and the metrics go to Mimia, which is kind of nice. And I would recommend using Tempo instead of Jaeger because it is very, very well integrated with the Grafana ecosystem. And it's easy to jump from your metrics to your traces because you can actually generate metrics from traces. Like every trace, as we've seen before, has like a duration. So we can extract this duration and save it as a time series metric. Same goes for logs. You can jump from your traces to the logs to figure out what's, what went wrong. One final piece of the puzzle here is Grafana exemplars. It's, it's it's part of the open metrics spec, so I pulled this uh, example screenshot from the open metrics spec. Uh, so you basically annotate your time series data with an example trace. Uh, you can see the foo bucket here. There are some requests that fall into this bucket, and one example would be trace KO something something. And you can just add this at the end of your um, time series. Quite easy to do. I, I was able to integrate it into all of my services with relative ease. So if we look at uh, how it looks uh, combined, I prepared like a short video for it. I'm not doing a, a live demo that always fails. So <laughs> you have to watch the video with me. It's uh, no sound, so I will talk you through. I think everyone saw Grafana dashboards at this point. It's uh, Pretty common, pretty straightforward. Um, I want to highlight the latency and the dashboard latency here on, on the slides, uh, because those two graphs are actually generated by Grafana exemplars. And let's look into it. We can jump from our Grafana dashboards into the traces really easy. And now I just select one of the traces and see the waterfall diagram here on the right. I see that there is an error, and I can watch all the error messages from there. Or I click the logs for the span button, and now I am in my logs. And you see the LogQL query on top here. I add the JSON parser for it, so I can actually pass the JSON log message. And just clicking on the log message expands it and displays all the fields just like I want them to. The other example that I want to make is for the dashboard latency. In this example application, I have a dashboard querying an API. And if I look at the trace here, I see the traces are in two different colors. That actually means that there are two different microservices involved. And I can even jump to the dependency graph here and see which uh, microservice called which other microservice and see all the spans in this uh, sort of uh, node graph. Now, I, I was talking about everything of this being open source. And sure, you can use it open source. 
Uh, you can run it on your own infrastructure, but it comes with some disadvantages. And it's not me trying to sell you Grafana Labs uh, products, but there are some costs involved in running your own infrastructure. I mean, it's nice on the pro side, you can control your data, your data is not leaving your premises, and sometimes that's exactly what you want. But it's also kind of expensive because you quickly need an entire observability team. Um, sure, I can run it for myself, by myself, and even host some other stuff on it, but it gets messy quite fast. If I want to performance optimize my LGTM deployment, I, I'm struggling. <laughs> Also, if you run your own monitoring, you always risk of losing your monitoring system. Like, if you have a data center outage, you also lose your monitoring infrastructure because it's in, it's in the same data center. And if that happens, you're essentially blind, and your feature engineering teams, they try to debug the problem, but they can't because they can't reach your observability stack anymore because it's down with the rest of the infrastructure, which is shit. So you need additional monitoring, you need outside monitoring, you need even more monitoring. So you go into a spiral of death really fast. Uh, <laughs> there is some advantage of buying like commercial products. I, I don't want to sound like the, the guy who says, come into the WhatsApp group or something, uh, but you might consider if you, I mean, if you run it at home, yeah, run it yourself, sure. If you run it for your business, maybe consider buying it from Grafana Labs directly and let, it, let them host it on their cloud. Yes, it's kind of expensive, but at the same time, you're funding open source development you make life easier for people who cannot afford buying Grafana Labs. So it's like, try to figure out what you can afford and can you afford the, ob the observability team or can you afford putting it into the cloud and don't worry about it. So because I only had so much time um, and I just couldn't include everything that I want wanted to talk about, I recommend you watching some other talks and uh, white papers and research it for yourself. And that's about it. I was a lot faster than I anticipated, but that leaves more time for Q&A. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. So, do we have any questions? Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, one in front. Fantastic. So, I have to, don't have to walk too far. Okay. Uh, do you have any experience migrating from an existing logging system like um, Kibana to uh, Grafana? Um, somewhat, yes. Um, I made the migration from Loki v1 to Elasticsearch back to Loki v2. And the, the best way to describe it, it, set a cutoff date, let's say the 15th of next month, and then you ingest all your data from that date going forward only in the new logging system. and keep the old data around, and if someone needs to look into historical logs, then send them to the old system, and after like a year or two or, or whatever your retention period is, turn the old service off. It is super painful migrating logs to another log aggregation system. Okay, more questions? I don't know. <laughs> So, and it really does scale, right? I mean, yeah, it's, I, I it's once like had the crazy. problem that I had kind of like World of Warcraft logs in Prometheus, and at one point uh, during a 40 people raid, um, the server just did not uh, oh, collect metrics anymore. It was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the entire Grafana stack, I, I showed you the, the architecture in more detail about how Mimir works. 
it works quite similar for all of the free microservices. So Loki works very similar and Tempo also works very similar to that. They all store the data in S3 buckets and they kind of have the same architecture with the distributors, the ingesters, and then the query front ends and everything tying together nicely. Yeah, looks good to me. <laughs> Okay. Nice. You can always reach out on my socials. I put them here on the slide as well. Uh, feel free. Don't use Twitter. <laughs> Text me on Mastodon. <laughs>